study that finds artificial sweeteners could put users at risk for diabetes. It actually makes it much harder to control your sugar, which is equivalent to diabetes. I know I'm stopping and telling my family to stop taking these artificial sweeteners now. Is brain cancer mortality increasing in industrial countries? Without any question, it is. Why? One of them may be, for some people, uh, increased consumption of aspartame. Odds are, aspartame is part of your diet. What should it be? I was horrified. I was panic-stricken. I was perspiring. I was scared to death on that night. And you think it's because of aspartame? I think it's very deliberately because of aspartame, yes. Historically, a Trojan horse has come to mean a type of trick which causes the target to willingly invite the enemy into their lives. Something which causes the target to let down their guard, inviting the enemy in, not knowing that what they perceive to be a gift is in reality their eventual demise. For decades now, rumors have spread about the potential negative side effects of artificial sweeteners, even alluding to them causing diseases such as cancer and diabetes. Some are even questioning whether artificial sweeteners can actually help individuals lose weight at all, suggesting that even without the calories, these sweeteners may be doing more harm than good. Are their credible health risks supported by consistent scientific evidence? Or is this simply an overreaction by a population influenced by media fear-mongering? Ultimately, are artificial sweeteners the Trojan horse of the food industry? Currently, there are multiple artificial sweeteners used in the foods we eat, but for the purposes of this video, we will simply focus on three. Aspartame sucralose, aka Splenda, and Stevia. During the 1970s and 80s, the FDA convened multiple task forces to assess the safety of aspartame until finally in 1983 aspartame was first approved for use in carbonated beverages and eventually in 1996 all food restrictions on aspartame were lifted altogether. Which is kinda weird considering they said at first it's fine for drinks but not for your food. It's official, aspartame is now legalized, however you can't eat it, we are still doing rigorous testing. But like, what if I drink it? Well, uh, I guess in that case, fuck it, YOLO! Despite popular belief, aspartame is not actually calorie free and provides the same 4 calories per gram as sugar and other carbohydrates. The key difference is that aspartame is approximately 200 times sweeter than regular table sugar, allowing manufacturers to use such small quantities that the calorie content is essentially negligible. So technically, your can of Diet Coke should look like this. HA! TAKE THAT COCA-COLA, I CAUGHT YOU! So, like... Is that enough for a class action lawsuit? PAPA NEEDS A NEW PAIR OF EVERYTHING! One of the tactics used by those who warn about the dangers of aspartame are naming the scary sounding names of the chemicals which combine to form aspartame. Aspartame is composed of 40% aspartic acid, 50% phenylalanine, and 10% methanol or wood alcohol. The amino acids, aspartic acid, and phenylalanine benefits your body's function but you ingest these amino acids excessively in aspartame. This, this is kind of what I'm talking about. They even went as far as to stick a skull and bones right next to aspartame as if it's going to make you drop dead or something, but they haven't actually given any real numbers. They throw these scary sounding words at you, but conveniently forget to mention that both aspartic acid and phenylalanine are amino acids naturally found in the human body. Aspartic acid is naturally found in foods like tuna, egg whites, and asparagus, while phenylalanine is found in soybeans, pumpkin seeds, chicken, and much more. Methanol from aspartame is extremely dangerous to humans. It is carried to susceptible tissues in your body where alcohol dehydrogenase, ADH, converts it to formaldehyde, the fluid used for embalming. Now this part sounds very scary using words like embalming fluid, but when you look at the numbers and the fact that formaldehyde already has a natural internal turnover in the human body, these levels of formaldehyde which originate from normal intake of aspartame would only result in a fraction of a percent of the human body's daily natural formaldehyde turnover. The biggest health concern with aspartame is its supposed connection to cancer and the formation of brain tumors, especially after a 1996 study potential connection between rising rates of brain tumors in the 70s and 80s and aspartame being made available to the public coincidentally around the same time. But these findings suffer from the issue of correlation not equating to causation. For example, you may see a rise in variable A as variable B increases and assume that B must have caused the spike in A, but this ignores other variables like C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, you get the picture. Another study which caused some commotion was a 2005 Italian experiment which involved feeding aspartame at various concentrations to rats and then checking for incidents of cancer once the rats died of old age. The results of this study show for the first time that aspartame, in our experimental conditions, causes an increased incidence of malignant tumor-bearing animals with a positive significant trend in males and females. The experiment showed statistically significant increases in rates of cancer were found in rats consuming aspartame in concentrations as low as 20 mg per kilogram of body weight. 
This would be the equivalent of a 160 pound male drinking about 8 cans of Diet Coke per day, which is excessive, but it's not ridiculous. Besides, I personally wouldn't feel too comfortable drinking 1-2 to two Diet Cokes per day, knowing that just 6 more and I'm at risk of cancer. However, this experiment has been wildly criticized by the scientific community. For starters, the experimental design did not follow the standard guidelines of their own institute which published the study in the first place. In addition, the original study hypothesized that cancer was caused by methanol found in aspartame which is then metabolized into the carcinogen formaldehyde. However, again, there is nowhere near a dangerous amount. You can actually find about 6 times more methanol in a single glass of tomato juice than you would in an average drink sweetened with aspartame. In addition, although there is one somewhat flawed study which indicates a potential link between aspartame and cancer in rats, there are numerous studies which find the exact opposite finding, with one actually being relatively similar to this rat study and finding, quote, there was no significant difference in the incidence of brain tumors between control and test groups. It is concluded that aspartame did not cause brain tumors in rats of this study. And the last commonly reported issue when it comes to aspartame seems to be a higher amount of consumer reports complaining of headaches. However, when it comes to headaches, this is one of those symptoms it's very difficult to point down because everything causes headaches. For example, one report noted aspartame as a potential trigger in people who are already susceptible to headaches. However, so was cheese, hot dogs, fruits, chocolate, ice cream, pork, tomatoes, and much, much more. In conclusion, look at it this way. Unless 130 national regulatory agencies hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific articles and numerous scientific medical associations are all collaborating in some colossal nutritional conspiracy that rivals the Illuminati? Yeah, that Diet Coke you have every now and then, probably not gonna kill you. I think you're okay. Moving on from aspartame, let's talk about another artificial sweetener you all know and love. It's often found in that cute little yellow packet of sunshine. I am of course talking about sucralose, the artificial sweetener found in Splenda. Sucralose has been estimated to be as much as a thousand times sweeter than table sugar, making it significantly sweeter than even aspartame. It was invented in 1976 by British scientists working with sucrose, aka regular sugar. One of the scientists was told to test the chlorinated sugar derivative, but misheard the statement as tasted, so he did, and discovered the compound was exceptionally sweet. Whoa, 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 what the hell? Some guy tells you to taste some weird chemical you're working on in the lab and you just go right ahead and do it? This is literally the same thing as what your parents tell you as a kid about peer pressure. Well, Billy, if all the cool kids are jumping off a bridge, would you do it? God damn it, if people are this impressionable, what the hell am I doing wasting my time making science fitness videos? I'm just gonna make garbage videos yelling at people to buy my crap and promote my channel. I bet no one's thought of that. Logopod.com slash Logopod.com slash Mmm. In fact, sucralose has actually started to rise in market share after companies like Pepsi decided on using it as a replacement for aspartame amongst growing consumer concerns about safety. Pepsi is pulling the sweetener aspartame from several of its diet drinks in the U.S. Other companies, too, are increasingly giving customers healthier choices. But is it that much safer? And for that, let's take a look at the evidence. So sucralose has been accepted as safe by numerous regulatory agencies, such as the FDA, World Health Organization, Food Standard Australia, and the Canadian Diabetes Association, who stated that the safe amount of sucralose a human can consume over one's lifetime is 9 milligrams per kilogram of body weight every day. Considering one packet of Splenda only contains about 5% sucralose by weight, this comes out to about 50 milligrams of sucralose per packet. At this rate, a 160 pound man can consume about 13 packets of Splenda every day for the rest of his life and still fall under this recommended limit. However, it's not exactly all sunshine and rainbows. These organizations are not perfect and have been wrong in the past. A prime example of this was cinnamol and thranolate, an artificial flavoring that imitated grape and cherry flavors which was classified as generally recommended as safe, or GROSS, by the FDA only to be banned in 1985 after it was discovered to cause liver cancer in mice. The only problem is that by this time, cinnamol and thranolate had already been used by us for almost 50 years in drinks, baked goods, gums, soaps, detergents, creams, lotions, and so much more. That being said, moving on to the science, a 2008 study done by Duke University caused some commotion when it proposed the link between sucralose and adverse health effects, such as a reduction in beneficial microflora, that's the good kind of bacteria, increased pH levels in the intestines, and also contributed to increases in body weight. However, a follow-up expert panel report analyzed this study and described it as, quote, not scientifically rigorous and deficient in several critical areas that preclude reliable interpretation of the study results. In addition, the original study was actually financed by the sugar industry aka the very industry which is threatened by the artificial sweetener being evaluated. So yeah, kind of a big conflict of interest there, you know, just my opinion. 
In addition, multiple other studies have analyzed sucralose's impact on cancer, body toxicity, and overall safety, and all these studies came to the same conclusion, with sucralose causing no adverse health effects, even when consumed at relatively high dosages. The last thing I want to mention is that even if you are worried, and even if this, you know, this doesn't set your mind at ease, and you think that you may be consuming too much sucralose, chances are you are actually absorbing a tiny fraction of what you ingest. Only about 11-27% to 27 of the sucralose you ingest is actually absorbed by the human body. The remainder is... um... Then, of the amount that is absorbed, only 20-30% to 30 is metabolized, with the remainder being filtered out by the kidneys. This means that out of all the sucralose that you ingest, you are only metabolizing and using about 8%. The third and final sweetener I want to touch upon is stevia, which is in my opinion the most interesting sweetener because it's not artificial. Stevia is actually found in nature. It's extracted from the leaves of the plant Stevia ribau. I am not even going to try to pronounce that one. The sweetener is approximately 150 times sweeter than regular table sugar, and aside from a slightly bitter or licorice-like aftertaste, it's pretty damn good. That being said, getting into the science, one study tested the effects of stevia on both body weight gain and biochemical parameters and found, quote, stevia sweetener at 500 milligrams per kilogram per day helps in weight loss of rats, decreasing total cholesterol, triglycerides, and low-density lipoprotein concentration. That's the bad kind of cholesterol. As for cancer, a 2002 Japanese study actually showed stevia having inhibitory effects on 12 o tetras uh, tetras, uh, uh, TPA, which is a carcinogen that promotes tumor growth, essentially meaning stevia could potentially have anti-cancer properties. So all of this, it sounds pretty damn good for stevia, but I do want to advocate caution as stevia is not as well researched as other sweeteners like aspartame. And it may seem like stevia is the clear winner due to its natural status, but there's a lot of things out there that are natural and still terrible for you. Arsenic is technically natural. It's important to remember that there is a lot of stuff that occurs naturally in nature, which can also also still kill you and like 90% of it is found in Australia. Seriously guys, I love my time there, but I stayed within my little city bubble and even then, every time I saw a lizard on the street, I knew there was a 30% chance that it could bite me, make my dick turn purple and explode. Okay, so all of this sounds good. It seems like although you probably shouldn't have 15 Diet Cokes a day or 20 packets of Splenda, if you consume them in regular amounts, chances are they're not gonna kill you. I know, sounds fantastic, right? I'm sure Coca-Cola is gonna come around any day now for that Vitruvian Physique sign of approval. But there is still one big criticism of artificial sweeteners, and that is that they actually do not help with weight loss, and even though they are lower in calories, they actually end up causing more weight gain by increasing cravings, causing insulin spikes, and generally disrupting healthy eating patterns. This experiment tested whether aspartame would have any negative effects on individuals consuming a standardized diet. Essentially, all other variables were kept constant. Participants were given concentrated doses of aspartame daily while dieting for 13 weeks, and surprisingly, the final results indicated more weight weight loss in the aspartame group as opposed to the placebo group. The article even went as far as to say, quote, in no instance was there a detectable effect of the ingested aspartame. Essentially, even with the daily high dose of aspartame, weight loss was completely unaffected. And there were many other studies showing similar effects, which I unfortunately do not have the time to analyze in the confines of this video, but they all came to similar conclusions with artificial sweeteners essentially having no negative effects on weight loss. Oh my god! Oh my god! I'm so excited! But there is still one potential problem when it comes to artificial sweeteners specifically related to weight loss that I wanted to talk about. And this this is this isn't as overly sciencey, which is why I want to talk, you know, face to face. There actually was one article which illustrated this point very well in my opinion. This article looked at multiple other studies and it came to the hypothesis that essentially when individuals have a mismatch between calorie content of the food they're eating and actual sweet taste, taste sweet but there is no sugar, there's no calories in it, it can potentially lead to a compensatory mechanism and these individuals, it can make them overeat and go into a positive calorie surplus. It's kind of like those jokes or those memes where <laughs> it's not exactly that nice, but uh, an individual will get like, like 9,000 calories of food, but they'll follow it up with, and a Diet Coke. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of like that. And one more article, guys. I promise this is the last one in this entire video. This one summarizes an excellent position, which I personally do agree with based on my personal experience and the research I've done in this video. Although they have been shown to be associated with some modest weight loss in randomized controlled trials, intense sweeteners are not appetite suppressants. Their ultimate effects will depend on their integration within a reduced energy diet. 
So, in conclusion guys, to wrap up this already somewhat long-winded video, let's be honest, artificial sweeteners from a health standpoint, they don't really do anything. But from a weight loss standpoint, yeah, they don't really do anything. It really is like you are taking something into your body which may as well not even be there because, at least from the evidence that I have analyzed, which is in my opinion a substantial amount, it's just like, it's like you're taking in air. It just does nothing. So, in the spirit of that, I'll see you guys in the next video. Pichu, what are you doing? What are you doing back there? Bye guys! Don't forget to subscribe, comment, like my video, and all that cool stuff. What's happening here? Also guys, big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. So, our world, it's getting more and more competitive every day, and simply doing the bare minimum in your career or anything else you aspire to improve at, it's simply not enough. And that's where Skillshare comes in. They have over 19,000 classes in teaching you the practical skills needed to beef up your resume or simply pick up a new hobby. My personal recommendations would be the courses on Microsoft Excel, especially if you guys work in the corporate world or any other office environment and you really want to get ahead to increase your chances of getting the promotion or getting a higher paying job, that would definitely help. When I first graduated college, Skillshare didn't exist and to land my first internship, I had to teach myself relevant skills using an 800 page book I bought on Amazon for like a hundred bucks. Or on the other hand, maybe you're interested in starting your own YouTube channel and in that case they have fantastic courses teaching you both the basics and advanced skills needed to master Adobe Premiere Pro, the software that I personally use to edit my videos. Premium membership starts at just 10 bucks a month but the first 299 people to sign up using the link in the description box below will get two full months of Skillshare for free. So guys, if there's anything you've ever wanted to learn without expensive private lessons or torturing yourself with stuff like this, then yeah, definitely give Skillshare a try. Hadouken!